Welcome everyone to another iteration of a cross-border webinar. Today's topic is the future of project-based learning, a conversation with Dr. Mike Barger. Before I introduce our CEO, uh, just really quick, as participants within this webinar, you are muted the entire time. Please feel free to submit questions or comments through your Q&A function on your toolbar at any time. And our CEO, who is moderating the, moderating the conversation, will get to it uh, if he can. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce GBSN CEO Dan LeClaire to begin the conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Nicole. We uh, appreciate the uh, introduction and getting us started. And welcome, everyone. I'd like to add uh, my warmest welcomes to all of you who joined us from all over the world for these uh, webinars. Uh, this welcome comes on behalf of not just myself, but the whole Global Business School Network. We're a network of more than 100 schools in 50 countries. Uh, we're working together with business, NGOs, and governments to improve management uh, in the developing world. And we do this through improving access to quality, uh, locally relevant management education in these environments. Now, it's great to see you, Mike. I, I appreciate you joining um, us this morning, it's, especially since this was normally something I would do one-to-one -one with you, right? We catch up and we um, uh, learn about what's happening at Michigan Ross. Uh, so we especially appreciate your willingness to do this live. Sure, my pleasure. It's the, uh, it's the new normal, if you will, right? <laughs> right, right. So, you know, this opportunity to uh, learn about what you've done with your colleagues at Michigan Ross with the multidisciplinary action projects, as well as what you're doing with internships and what your plans are for the fall for the next academic term and how that's playing out. Uh, what a great opportunity to share this dialogue with others as well. And again, uh, as Nicole said, we encourage you to. Um, um, post your questions and um, in the Q&A or the chat and hopefully we can integrate that and make you all of you a part of the conversation as we as we go. Now uh, Dr. Mike Berger, I'm not gonna uh, spend a lot of time with the intro since we have the bio, uh, but I, there are a few things I think are, are important to uh, put out there. He's a professor of business administration and executive director of the Office of Strategy and Academic Innovation. Now, why is that important for this conversation? Um, so uh, the way it's organized at Michigan Ross, the, the OSAI function um, covers the Career Development Office, the Office of Action-Based Learning, Global Initiatives, and Technology and Academic Innovation Teams. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, all of these things that we're uh, focused on at the moment are, around the world and many business schools are, are um, within the realm of work of Mike and his colleagues at Michigan Ross. But he also teaches, he teaches courses in entrepreneurship and, and crisis leadership. But I, you know, call me a, a kid in a candy store sometimes, but I think it's worth mentioning that uh, one of the things that struck me about Mike uh, when we first met was that uh, after leaving the University of Michigan back in 86, I uh, went into the Navy as a, as a uh, pilot and spent uh, most of his formative years, I suppose, uh, in pilot education. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I'm sure it's a highlight, he may say different, but for me, again, the highlight being that he was uh, the lead instructor at Top Gun um, during part of that career. And uh, after that, went to found, uh, be one of the co-founders at JetBlue and uh, to start a corporate university there. So this, and, and then after leaving JetBlue, went to uh, also continue with education. Right, so it seems like this combination of, of aviation and uh, education is something that uh, has been pretty important in your uh, development, Mike, and um, uh, I'm just uh, really excited that you're willing to speak with us here today about that experience and how it's played out in, in terms of your work at REP. Well, we should get started right away. Um, you know, I posted on LinkedIn yesterday about this conversation. I, 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 I posted a picture I took in your office on March 5th. You remember that? I was in your office. I was in the, on campus for a, a bunch of things. And, 
uh, we had this nice conversation. You had on your screens this photograph of, uh, of um, where the hotspots were around the world, uh, represented by red circles, and, and where you had map projects represented by little yellow stars. Mm -hmm. And at the time, they were, there wasn't that much overlap, right? <laughs> right? Your stars <laughs> weren't falling into the circles that much. I remember that, right, on March 5th. And then uh, I left campus the next day, and I think the Monday following that, things changed. And I, I wonder if you could walk, me, walk us through that. But before you do, give us a little context, you know, how many students were we talking about involved with these projects? How many companies? How many countries? Give us a, a little bit of context about the scale, and then we'll jump right in to talk about this experience. Great. Well, so uh, I, think, um, I think many of our, our folks joining us today have a sense of, of Michigan Ross's commitment to experiential learning, and this whole MAP program of ours was developed about 28, uh, 29 years ago. And the idea was, uh, given the two-year MBA footprint for our, our graduate uh, business students, is that we wanted to create something at the end of their first year that allowed them to uh, a get away from Ann Arbor a little bit and get out into the world and and you know start to apply some of the concepts that they've been learning, but also to build some skills in in just basic uh, you know consulting uh, skills. So you know how do you frame up a problem? How do you have conversations with a sponsor? How do you um, you know narrow down the the problem so you can go do some research and collect some data and just a, a a typical set of skills that anyone in business would want to be able to apply to any problem they were given or team they were assigned to. So for 28 years now, we've been running with all of our first year MBAs, this MAP program. It happens in the, the second quarter of our winter semester. So it's the very last thing that our first year MBAs do. Uh, it in, uh, it's a required core course, so all 420 plus students um, are looking to do some sort of a, an experiential project. Um, typically, uh, what we'll do is we will, we have a, a, an individual, a team of people actually, but, but primarily one individual that is responsible for relationships with businesses that are interested in getting a team of these students to help them with a problem. And their, their problems typically fall into a, a small handful of categories. Maybe it's a strategy problem they're working with. Maybe it's a new product market entry. Maybe it's some sort of a, you know, social impact project. So it's, it's those kinds of really uh, complex, but in, interesting and engaging projects. We then, uh, we take the the, the interest from our sponsors, we generally collect about 100, between 110 and 120 projects. And those are from, oh, maybe 100 to 120 businesses. Sometimes there are businesses that offer multiple projects. And we take all of those projects, we, summer, we write short summaries of them, we put them out in front of our 420 plus students, and they bid on them. So they get to express you know, interest in, you know, I wanna do these projects in these locations. Uh, back to your, your uh, yellow stars all over the global map. Uh, typically these projects are across somewhere between 30 and 40 countries. So you know, it's, it, it, they are definitely global projects. Um, these students are, are, they bid on the projects they want. We then uh, kind of process their bids. We, we assign groups of, uh, generally, it's four to six students per project, um, and then we uh, uh, we connect the students that wanted projects with the companies that uh, that you know made their proposals, and and for seven weeks, these 420 plus students in their teams head out across the world to help these companies solve their issues. So that's the the 30,000 foot context of what these map projects are all about. Well, uh, thanks for that. You know, I I. I you know, want to say number one about your point about how long you've been doing this. And, um, and my previous work in uh, uh, AACSB, I remember this is one of the things we, we tried to highlight that pioneering work and 
often when we did uh, programs on experiential learning or project-based learning in particular, we went to, uh, to Michigan. But I also want to say that, you know, over the years I've been involved with management education, um, the MAP program is one of those things that, one of those few things that I've heard many students uh, say, this is why I'm joining uh, this program. You know, we, you know, sure, I like the faculty, sure, I like mm -hmm. <laughs> the environment, but really why I'm coming is for the, for the MAP program. So, so you, you had about, I, my math is a little rusty, but so you must have ended up with between 80 and 100 of these projects and then. Yeah, spot on. So, so we take that 100 to 120 submissions, we put them in front of students and we ended up, for this past year, we ended up with 83 projects that 83 got staffed. projects. And maybe uh, 30, between 30 and 40 countries, as you said. And, Correct, and, that was the plan. Right. <laughs> so here we are sitting in your office. And, and I remember this. I remember probing you about this in particular. I said, you know, things seem to be changing pretty quickly. Right. But um, at the time, I think a few of the teams have um, were re reoriented digitally because mm -hmm. the companies themselves, like I think Amazon was already saying that we're not hosting teams mm -hmm. on, on our campuses, uh, on our properties. Um, but in general, there are quite a few teams uh, rare and to go. And, um, and then I left and now walk us through what happened after that. Um, you got the note from the president at Michigan and then uh, what happened? Right. So at the time we were chatting, so uh, I think everyone is pretty familiar with just the timeline of how you know, COVID-19 has uh, spread across the globe. But at the, uh, at the beginning of, oh, let's say uh, March, so we had been watching this thing start to develop in China, uh, as we all know. And uh, we had a handful of projects in China. So we had already started to reach out to those companies and say, okay, travel might be a little bit of a challenge here. Uh, are there other ways that we can complete these projects? And it turns out that all but one of our sponsors uh, said, we can be creative and figure out other ways to do this. So, so it really started, uh, Dan, to your, your question of what allowed this to happen. It started with the great relationships that we had already had with these sponsors, uh, the fact that we've got you know, almost 30 years of experience doing this. So when we reached out to them, it was, it was not, uh, hey, we've got a problem. It was more, all right, we're, we're gonna have to overcome some challenges here. How do we figure this out together? Um, also at that time, we started to see little hotspots uh, you know, cropping up all over the world, including on the west coast of uh, the United States. So out in Seattle, out in, in, uh, in California. And so we continued the outreach with our sponsors to try to figure out creative ways that we could execute these projects without having to travel, which as you would imagine, um, was really disappointing for our students. You know, the, as you said, they really look forward to this part of the Ross experience. Uh, experiential learning is, is core to what we believe is important in business education. And so there was a brief period of time, right, as you were, you know, when you paid me a visit and then you left, that week, uh, we went from a small handful of projects that would have to be done virtually to most of the projects that would have to be done virtually. In fact, when we kicked off our, we did our, our MAP uh, you know, kickoff session with all the students, which we did on site at Ross, um, we told them that, that essentially anything other than a local project was gonna have to be done virtually, which you know, wasn't particularly well received and was very disappointing for students. Um, but in the, literally the week prior to kickoff, we had gone from, you know, five projects that were going to be remote to 83 projects that were going to be remote. So that was quite an adventure, but uh, the students were remarkably resilient. The sponsors were, were very welcoming. I think it's fascinating that, that the number one piece of feedback from our sponsors was, you know, we don't normally work virtually. And so this is a little odd for us. We're not really sure what it's gonna look like, but we'll give it a try. And now here we are three months later and guess how the world is doing business now, right? Right, right. Well, you know, this is interesting. You said that initially there was some uh, disappointment, mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, uh, you know, and especially in business, sometimes we just do the best we can with what we have. And, 
Um, it sounds like your students really stepped up to that challenge. And I'm wondering if, there, if you can share with us uh, whether some, some things popped out of those experiences that suggest how the students managed to make it a good one um, to um, make the kind of recommendations that, that became important to the companies. What, what did they learn in the process, if you could share some of those ideas? Well, I think they learned the same kinds of things, Dan, that you and I are learning or anyone that's on the call today about uh, being able to do business uh, virtually is the, you know, we, I think we all are sort of hardwired to believe that in order to get work done, you need opportunities to get in the same room with people. Uh, and I think the, you know, the jury's still out a little bit on the, the kind of the pluses and minuses of being co-located. Um, but the reality of these kind of projects, these MAP projects, is that you know, students weren't going to be spending every minute of every day with their sponsors. They would meet with their, their executive sponsor. They would get some guidance. They would go do some work, either in you know, subsets of their team or as individuals come back with their team and you know, move the project along and then get back with their sponsor. So, so I think that the, the way the tempo of these projects typically worked is the, the on-site part was you know really important culturally and for the kind of the externalities of the project but the actual work process itself actually was even i i would argue a little more efficient doing it virtually right there's no uh, transition time there's no travel time there's no you know none of that so i think a lot of our students found that they were really pleasantly surprised with how accessible the sponsors were how easy it was, uh, I know it's the bane of our existence now, but how easy it was to jump on a Zoom call and, you know, right, 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 out right. a five minute conversation or an hour long conversation. So I think, I think our students learned, as the sponsors learned, like everybody on the call today has learned, is we, we may not love sitting in our office doing virtual work, but you can actually do some really good, you know, you can do some good. Yeah, what, one quick question, and then I wanna ask a little bit about, um, the feedback that you received from the students, a little bit more detail about um, the kinds of things that they might uh, have, have missed. But before we get to that, I wonder if, if your, your colleagues, how, how did the support that they provide change a little bit? I imagine you had a little bit of integration going on between the, the Office of Action Learning and the Office of Information Technology, right? Yeah. Well, I think the, um, you know, we, we, when we knew we were going to go all virtual, we got all of the, the groups together at Ross and, you know, talked through how are we going to make this work. And um, I know I've said it several times already today in the 20 minutes we've been together, but, you know, our business sponsors were all figuring this out at the same time we were. So, you know, uh, U of M already had a video conferencing system that we preferred. Uh, we were just, the world was just starting to get their introduction to Zoom and right, right. its capabilities. So we had to work through, you know, all of that. Um, but it was a pretty seamless transition. Um, the, uh, you know, we, I, in fact, I, I think it turned into being a really interesting learning outcome of the, the whole project is, all right, we've run into some adversity here. Uh, we weren't really expecting this. Now we got to figure out a solution. And and so in some ways, we let the teams figure out on their own, Dan. Uh, right. Okay, it's a you got one problem. Big, so you a moment, moment, right? That's it's right. A, it's, it's, that's one of the things we've learned that, that many business schools have been quick to adapt and really leverage this opportunity to learn and, and teach um, yeah. as well. Yeah. But uh, let me just, uh, and then we want to switch gears after this question and, and talk a little bit about how this experience translates into the summer internships and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the uh, consulting core. Uh, but, you know, in the, in the overall review, um, the way I think you just described it is that overall they started with a little disappointment, but began to appreciate this. And I'm sure, you know, by the time they were finished, they felt good about uh, that experience and, and um, a stronger connection to Ross. But if you had to put your finger on the, you know, one to three things that in the feedback they felt like they wished they would have had. Yeah. Or, um, what would those one to three things be? 
Well, I think I'll, I'll point back at the, the cultural benefits of the kind of the immersion in the local cultures, in the cultures of the organizations. It's, you know, we spend a lot of time on Zoom now. And, you know, when you're, when you're working with someone that you don't know very well, yes, you can do lots of good work virtually, but it is really hard to get a sense of kind of the essence of the organization, right? And so, so two big aspects of, uh, of this map program historically are the immersing into the organizational culture of the sponsor company. That's one aspect. Um, and then secondly, it's, it's immersing, immersing yourself in the, the culture of the community and the, you know, the region and the country that you're in. And so I, you know, I don't really know how to duplicate that through technology and and I don't think going forward, we're gonna say, this was so great that we're never gonna travel again. Um, but we certainly have learned that, uh, that you can do some really good business virtually. Um, right. And so, you know, I would say that the, the second thing we learned is just that, is that the, you know, the, the students all figured out that, you know, being resilient and being able to deal with adversity and be creative about, you know, finding solutions um, is a really important business skill. And, and, you know, between you and me, Dan, this won't be lost on anybody on the call. Uh, as a business leader, figuring out how to deal with the unknowns of tomorrow, the ambiguities, the complexities, the volatilities, right? Yeah. Um, that, that may become one of the most valuable business skills ever, because it's not going <laughs> right. to get any, right. things aren't going to calm down any next week or next year. Well, I agree. Uh, we're hearing a lot about that at the moment. And, and, and it's uh, for a long time, I think we've been told in business schools, we need to provide those kinds of skills. Now we have a, a stronger understanding about that. A couple of questions came in over the chat, uh, Mike. And I think before we shift gears a little bit, maybe it's, it's a good idea to, to address uh, one or both of them. First of all, there's a combination from a colleague, uh, uh, Jeffrey, and he says, thanks, Mike, for a great presentation. But he's wondering who meets the logistical uh, in-country costs for the students while at a project site? So what happens when they get to the site? How do they, how is this um, paid for? Yeah, so the framing of this is um, uh, we, we, when we recruit sponsors, we let them know that, um, you know, in exchange for the service that these students are providing, because it really is beneficial for the sponsor. Um, we do not have sponsors anymore that view this as a, hey, we're doing a favor to the University of Michigan by sponsoring some students. Um, they come to us with, uh, with problems that they literally can't solve. We, this is, this, we just, we don't have the bandwidth, we don't have the expertise, we don't have, uh, you know, the ability to put some boots on the ground and go solve this thing. So in exchange for that value proposition, what we ask of our sponsors is that they cover the, the travel and the lodging and the expenses of the students on site. And we actually have an internal process that walks through that conversations with sponsors so they know kind of exactly what they're on the hook for uh, going in. Um, and over the last few years, um, sponsors have been, you know, in particular these last few years, sponsors have been great about the, you know, wow, what a, what a value I'm getting for just, you know, that amount of administrative support. Well, thanks. There's a, another question again, and I want to use the opportunity to maybe ask the question a little bit more generally. Maybe you can focus on the particular point that the, uh, the um, person, Tarek, is asking, um, but then generalize that a little bit. He's asking about the best stage in the curriculum for experiential learning. And I, you know, the way I, 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 I'd like to frame the question is, is maybe, is there anything that you learned or your colleagues learned about experiential learning, about project-based learning from this experience that might suggest different ways of doing this? I know that you do this at the end of the first year Right. Um, and um, but you also have a really large undergraduate population. There's a lot of things to uh, to consider. And a lot of people feel now that sometimes we wait too long to have the multidisciplinary or integrative experience. Right. Um, you know, so if you could answer this question more generally, what have you learned that might suggest different ways of thinking about experiential learning moving forward for Ross? 
but then um, also the specific question about the, the right place in the curriculum. Yeah, I, that's a great question. And um, uh, if there's someone we could attribute that to, that's a great question. So acknowledge if that question came in from one of our guests today, great question. It is. Um, it is. I, the, um, you know, the research on this is pretty interesting. I think that uh, there is a school of thought that you know, any experience uh, could be useful if it's framed the right way. Uh, we found over the years that, um, you know, this kind of midpoint in the program works really well uh, because they do have a little bit of a, a foundational understanding of some of the core concepts um, that they'll have to apply uh, during the project. So it is interesting that we, that we make it explicit when we um, are orienting students to this project, um, their MAP project, that the goal is not necessarily to have them go out and apply everything they've learned in their first year. So this, these are not set up as, and here's your final assignment for the first year, because we don't really know for sure where these projects are going to go. Um, it, a lot of the value here is dealing with the kind of the ambiguity and complexity of the project and students just have to figure out how to navigate that. So we, we give them some very basic kind of framing tools and then, you know, let them go. Um, now, you mentioned earlier in the introduction that I spent some time out at the Top Gun School in the Navy and was a flight instructor for a lot of years. And one of the things that, uh, that Top Gun does really well, in fact, militaries around the world tend to do this really well, is that they, they create these experiential learning opportunities and the students or learners go out and execute them, but then they understand how important it is to unpack those experiences afterwards so that we can make sense of you know, what happened and what really we should take away. Um, and so I say all that to say that any experiential learning program can be valuable, but I'm going to argue that it's not the experience itself that contains the, the majority of the value. It's the post experience unpacking of what happened and how closely or not did it meet my expectations? How well did I perform? What would have helped me perform better? What worked well, what didn't work well? All of that post-event unpacking, debriefing, we call it in the military, yeah. is the vital component of these experiences. So if any of your guests today are thinking about setting up experiences, um, I would spend just as much time thinking about the, how are we gonna unpack it afterwards as how were we going to make it great during? That's, that's great. In fact, the, the question asker, uh, Tarek, um, um, was wondering specifically about small repetitive programs. So instead of one or two big ones, yeah. multiple small ones. And I, and I think that's a direction many schools are taking now in response to COVID, right? You know, how do you, how do you instead of this one big international experience, how do we do many little ones? and, and um, uh, so, so I, my my uh, my challenge for everyone remains the same. We we you still need to to be able to unpack, you know, uh, what just happened. Um, I think it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. So, uh, Tarek and and whoever else is asking about small ones versus the large ones, um, because one of our objectives is really putting, uh, you know creating a challenge for students to navigate a lengthy project. Mm -hmm. There are some additional, I think, right. challenges that come along with something that's seven weeks long, because right. you're not right. just looking at, well, I just got to, if I can just get through this week, it'll all be done. No, it's, it's not that. You've got this week and then six more, or then you know, the second week and five more. So it's, a, it's an extended challenge, which means that the scope of work um, you know, isn't just going to be this, it could, it could be doing that. Right. And that's that part of the that challenge is corralling that. So, so my, 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 my response back to anyone that was thinking about shorter, longer benefits, you know, strengths, weaknesses, um, a lot of it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I think short immersions can be spectacularly effective. And I would argue that every single mission that we ran at the Top Gun School with students had an incredible impact. But the, these longer experiences do create different types of challenges. And so just be really clear about what you're trying to accomplish. Great. 
you know, I'm 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 so anxious to shift gears, but there's so many questions <laughs> that are popping into the into the system, and I and they're good. We found ones. a sweet spot, then that's good. <laughs> they're good ones. You know, there, there's a set of questions here revolving around the companies: how you recruit them, how do you how do you um, really gain their interest? I know by now you have a steady core of companies that you work with, yeah. but um, if you could address that question, but also your, to your point, which I really strongly in is this unpacking what you've learned. How do you engage the companies in that process? In a way, sometimes I describe, how do you put the, how do you keep the learning in experiential learning, right? Yeah, so it's not yeah. just experiential. Um, if you could just address that quickly and then, um, then we'll try to make the transition. Yeah, so there's, so there's a couple of questions there. In the, in, the, in the sponsor recruitment, it also popped up here in our, our questions for panelists. Um, you know, the, uh, unfortunately for many of you, we have the luxury of, uh, you know, over a half a million alums at the university and, you know, 60,000 or so alums of the business school, uh, many of whom have done really well and are now, you know, leading organizations. And so, you know, our recruitment practices, you know, start with A, who, who has been a part of Matt previously and they had a great experience, so they want to do it again. And then B, for new uh, sponsors, all right, what's our, who are our alums that are doing cool things in the space who enjoyed a formative experience in their own Matt project, you know, in years prior. So, right. so we sure. do tend to lean uh, kind of heavily on folks that are familiar with the program. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't start from scratch. I think, uh, I think being really clear about the value proposition that, you're, that you have to offer a sponsor, uh, you are getting value out of the student experience. Um, we do, we haven't talked about this, Dan, but we do attach faculty oversight to these projects. So it's not just, a, you know, turn the students loose and good luck. You know, there's a, there's a, a point, a, a primary point of contact at the sponsor who generally is the person that had the problem to solve that wasn't able to solve it with their own resources. So they're motivated to get this right. And then there are faculty attached to these projects and they want the students to learn and have a good experience. So they've got some skin in the game. So, so there is a value proposition starting point. Uh, in terms of the keeping the learning and experiential learning, um, I think it really does start with clarity of expectations up front with all of the stakeholders. So students know kind of what their skin in the game is. Um, we spend a lot of time with sponsors before the project, during the project and after um, talking, unpacking, as we've talked about today, the here's what you hoped you would get out of this. What were the things that you did along the way to optimize that? And next year, when you come back, because you're going to come back next year, so always marketing, right? Always be, marketing, <laughs> always be closing, um, yeah. is, uh, hey, what are the things we're going to do differently next year to really focus the student team on what needs to get done and making sure that they meet your expectations? So that's, that's how I would describe the, you know, keeping the learning. It starts with setting expectations up front with everybody. It continues with kind of ongoing nurturing of value mm -hmm. and then it and then it finishes with a, a the wrap-up debrief hey what what do we do how did it work what can we do better next time see you in a few months well some of those points that you've made in fact throughout the conversation so far i think are relevant to another question and i'll just uh, point it out and then we'll transition because i think that was a a really good time because these companies became important as you as you pivoted into looking at internships right what's happening there uh, but i just want to make a note that i think many of the things that you've talked about uh, uh, right now obviously we're talking about international projects you know projects all over the place but many of the lessons that you learned and the, the ways you approach this are helpful locally as well so many schools do um, these consultancy projects but they're largely local um, right um, so I, th I think, uh, uh, unless you want to add anything to that, Mike, I think we'll move on to, to talk about internships. No, that'd be great. Yeah. You, you know, so w the way I understand it, just from um, um, paying attention to what's happening, is that a lot of your work in MAP turned out to be pretty useful as you began to think about what's happening in internships. And, right. you know, I think it's roughly a quarter of the students that were seeking internships. Oh, generally, not, not at Ross, but generally have been a little disappointed that they didn't materialize, but more, more likely, I think the, that the, the internships were changed, modified in some way. So even yeah. if we had an internship offer, um, 
had already accepted one that there's been a lot of uh, modification. One, one, of course, being moving it online, but also shortening them. Yeah. Um, and this is something that I know Ross has um, always paid a lot of attention to. And I wonder if you could show or tell us a little bit about how you uh, have approached that. Sure. Well, so I, my guess is that a number of people on the call today are, you know, are, are either at or familiar with how business schools tend to kind of help their students navigate the program that they're in. And in the business school world, internships are a really important part of just the process, right? So it's, you know, I think about it as the, as that experiential learning opportunity, right? Between your, your second, your penultimate year and your final year. So there, so whether you're a grad student or an undergrad student, and we have, um, you know, we have a, a very large, we've got 2,500 now undergraduate business students with us. So, you know, between their junior and senior year, that internship is a really formative experiential learning opportunity. And then between year one and two for our graduate students, the same thing. So as you said, Dan, as the, as the world was grappling with the impact of COVID-19, a lot of our internships, and typically we have almost 100% of our rising undergrad seniors and our you know, rising second year MBAs are doing internships over the summer. Um, and for the majority of them, they look at the internships as the kind of the first step toward a job offer with that company. So they spend a lot of time and effort figuring out who they want to intern with because that's, you know, that's the, that's the try and buy opportunity, right? From both sides of the equation, sponsor wise and student wise. Um, this year, as companies were grappling with uh, COVID, uh, there were lots of internships that got either delayed or shortened or moved online, like you said. And so uh, my team looked at this, and, and, uh, and sorry for being a little all over the place here. You mentioned earlier, Dan, that, that we've connected at Ross experiential learning and the careers office. And that's a really important connection because we really do view experiential learning as as a, the building of fundamental skills, not to get their degree, which they are, but more to prepare them for this crazy world of ours that they're gonna have to go out and work in. And so, the social capital that comes along with that, right? Well, absolutely, right. absolutely. So when we saw these, uh, some question marks uh, starting to appear over these internships, we felt like um, we could apply the same type of concepts to a summer program that we applied during MAP. So, so we had our, our, our primary kind of project sourcer um, who had been working with all of our MAP sponsors uh, put together a little email that went out to our sponsors and said, hey, um, we just had a really good winter experience with you, mostly virtual. Um, and now we're seeing that these, uh, these internships for our students are starting to dry up a little bit. What if we could offer you um, some project support from a small group of students, this time at no cost to you. So we're not, they're not going to travel. There's no real administrative costs. You're, you, you have no obligation other than to give us a sponsor and help us frame up a problem that a group of students might deal with. And we'll give them a, the equivalent of an internship experience over the summer. And we had uh, over 40 companies say, we're in. And, and the, the, for the, for if anyone on the call is wondering, well, what kinds of projects were you doing? Um, pretty much the standard project question from every one of these sponsors is, okay, what's my business going to look like in the fall as COVID does its <laughs> right. thing? You know, Again, what's going to happen to my customers, moment. right? What's, yeah. <laughs> so, so many of these projects are, you know, connected to that question. And so for students, it's, it's opportunities to work with businesses. It's a real problem that none of us have the answer to. We don't know how this is going to play out. And so it's just been a super experience. So we've got, you know, we've got close to 100 students working with, as it turns out now, about 25 companies that, uh, that, that are grappling with this problem. And it's been great. And in some cases, I imagine it complements those who are able to keep an internship, even if it was modified, it even complements that experience and not as a substitute for it, it sounds like. Absolutely, yeah. For most of the students in the program, and it is a mix of graduate and undergraduate students. In fact, we built, uh, 
teams of three to four students and all, my, all but one of the teams has some MBAs and some BBAs on it. So we've got grads and undergrads working together. Oh um, it's a nine week uh, program over the summer. There's a little bit of light academics. There's some you know, access to experts and guest speakers and that. So we try to really make it feel like it's an internship, although it's virtual and everyone's a little disappointed to have to do it virtually. Uh, but we're making some great progress. But to your, your comment, Dan, um, the majority of people in this program had, had either not been able to secure an internship or had lost theirs. There are a few people that are supplementing, but for the most uh, part, it was folks that were starting to you know, freak out a little bit, that they had big plans for the summer and now I have no plans. And so we created something that, uh, you know, that addressed a really big, important need. And if I understand it, it's under an umbrella called Business Consultancy Corps or yeah, something it's the, like that? It's yeah. the yeah. Summer Business Consultant Corps. And, yeah. uh, and it's a program that we, we really patterned after both the, the MAP programs that we run yeah. and this other program, Experiential Learning Program, called the Living Business Leadership Experience, which is another kind of immersive with business, trying to deal with the ambiguity of business. So we use those two programs. It's the same team of people that run those that's running this, and it's just been incredible. Sounds like another example of a uh, something we do in response to a challenge, but it ends up being a keeper. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like, which is which is great potentially. Yep. And you know, I think highlights. You know, I I think one of the things I've learned in some of the conversations that initially we're so focused on. Um, academic continuity, but really on the classroom experience. Mm -hmm. And what I see is uh, now a lot of uh, really interesting and innovative work on, you know, all of those other experiences that, that um, are part of the learning process, such an integral part of the learning process when it comes to business education in particular. But now we get, so we, we went from the spring, right? <laughs> so, right? March 5th, as we started from, and then we, we talked about the transition or the transformation of, of MAP uh, during the, the, the spring term. And then we went into the summer and looked at some internships and saw how those things complemented each other and, and shaped what uh, Ross is doing. But then we have the fall coming up. And right. I know you're, obviously you have not only Ross, but you have the whole institution. So there are a lot of colleagues working on this at the moment. Yes. Um, but I'm wondering if you could share with us some of the plans and, and how you might be handling the uncertainty, the, you know, the, the obviously the question of safety and health being paramount, but uh, doing it in a way that, that really, um, uh, it at the very least continues, if not ups our game when it comes to education. Um, you know, how are you thinking about the fall term? Yeah, I think the, um, I mean, I think ultimately there are still so many questions out there that were, you know, a, a, a significant challenge for, you know, program staff and faculty alike, or just how do I, how do I manage all of the potential directions that this thing could go? And so because there are still so many questions, um, which really does uh, kind of illustrate what business leaders are grappling with these days, right? All these questions. So I, I would say philosophically, what we're trying to do is create something that is ultimately able to run irrespective of the kind of global situation when we get to the next map cycle, right? So mm -hmm. let's build something that, uh, that allows us to take advantage of the opportunity to travel and do all of those immersions, you know, with sponsors, with uh, communities. But at the same time, let's make sure that we, that we are still able to execute it if we have the same kind of challenges we had last year. So, so what COVID forced us to do a little bit is to really look at what are the, what are the critical learning outcomes that we are shooting for. Um, how does an on-site experience allow us to meet those objectives? How can we simulate or duplicate that if we're not able to travel? And let's just build a set of processes that allow us to kind of navigate whatever environment we happen to be handed when it's time to start executing the program. And so uh, to me, uh, that, if that isn't a business you know, um, benefit, 
if you're not thinking about that as a business right now, hey, how do we operate in the old way? How do we operate in the new way? How do we operate in whatever thing we're handed? Um, Flexibility, right? And yeah, that is that is that is a key outcome of this program is how do we as a staff how do we help students figure out how to deal with this kind of ambiguity well i think that's uh fair enough i've heard from uh, schools that are you know understanding the different scenarios as many as nine different scenarios that might happen on the on the campus and i know this is very complicated and sensitive too sure. because you know there are questions now about you know how do we treat you know, uh, students that want to defer uh, their admission to another year. And I know uh, Ross is making some choices in that area. I don't know if yeah. you want to speak to that at the moment, but um, there are very important questions that uh, have a lot of um, impact on the, the, the program. Did you want to say something about that, Mark? Uh, all I would say, I think, is that um, I think some, I think lots of folks are making value judgments on kind of a set of assumptions about what value they can actually get from a school or a university now that may or may not be based in fact. I think we, I think we're making a lot of assumptions about, I don't want to learn online or, mm -hmm. you know, those programs aren't as effective. Um, I, I don't know, uh, you know, so I run, you know, digital education at Ross and I'd be the first one to say, I don't agree that we can't do great, you know, education online. Um, I would like to have you in the classroom. I also know that we can do some pretty cool things through technology. And so how do we find the right, uh, we're kind of referring to it as just hybrid around, around Ross. I think that's a common term, but how do we find the right mix of, of, acknowledging some of the, you know, the public safety issues that we have to grapple with now um, with the technology and with uh, faculty who are really smart in their area and who are really effective teachers. How do we blend all those things together? I actually think our students are going to have a great experience in the fall. It won't be what they were thinking about a couple of years ago when they made the decision to come to Ross, um, but I think they're going to be pretty happy with what they see. I think so too. You know, one of the things that uh, I hear a lot of, and I won't um, go through all the examples, but in these kinds of catch-up conversations I'm having with folks like you and deans and and professors, is is that what one of the things we're learning is that it, online education. Um, it, it it's definitely been helpful in terms of efficiency, being able to reach. Uh, people and continue uh, um, um, educating them or providing that access to education. But we're discovering that there are reasons uh, to believe and, and actually actions that we've taken that make the education even more effective in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that uh, will uh, come out of this is that we're pretty certain now that there are um, at least hybrid kinds of opportunities that were previous to COVID-19 not fully explored, and they will be uh, fully explored um, as a consequence. So this is very helpful. Now I want to ask, a, I know this might seem a little bit odd, but you know, I've been anxious to, to, to see if we might have time for me to ask this question, because when I think of, of pilot education, I think of simulations, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you must, there must be a lot of effort uh, put into the simulations because those are expensive machines right <laughs> they, are. they are but they're less expensive than having to take a real airplane out and learn in the real exactly. airplane <laughs> right and a lot of money time and energy goes into developing these and uh, one of the things i often have an opportunity to talk about in, in meeting with schools is this um, the future as it relates to virtual reality or augmented reality and, right uh, you know, just based on your experience, you know, for many years with uh, flight simulations and um, your experience with business education and the kinds of things we want students to learn as a result of experience. Right. What do you think about what's happening in this space? Do you think that there's a lot of opportunity or are we beating up the wrong tree? Uh, <laughs> I think I mixed up my metaphors. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Um, well, so, um, so first of all, I would say that there is always a cost benefit component to these kinds of things, yeah. right? So, you know, when, um, 
I mean, as someone who is, has run simulations in 20 million US dollar flight simulators or right. simulations at the Top Gun School where we'll take you know, 12 students and their fighter airplanes and we'll put up 30 or 40 other you know, simulated adversary airplanes and do these massive simulations. So that's my experience with simulation is that. And then I get in the business school environment or the corporate environment and, and we talk about you know, digital simulations on a computer. Um, and when you talk to people about what they really want, what they'll tell you is, well, I want, uh, you know, I want Doom. I want, a, I want a multi-million dollar video game kind of simulation. Um, I want that too. In fact, I, I happen to be quite a video gamer for, for those out there <laughs> thinking, who is this weirdo that's talking today? Um, I, I, do, I do some, some pretty good work on, uh, online. But anyway, I, I think the, the, um, the first question is cost benefit. I think we, you know, we don't want to ever chase the bright shiny thing for the sake of chasing the bright shiny thing. So, you know, VR, AR, XR, you know, all really interesting, still really expensive and hard to drive the kinds of outcomes that we want. Um, but that said, I do think that it's vitally important that we find ways to get our learners to experience things that they can learn from. So, you know, talking about what it's like to fly in an airplane is nowhere close to what it actually feels like to fly an airplane. Um, and that's why I, my, uh, I have a, a few sons uh, and uh, all of them are better than I am at uh, like fighter pilot video games. I, I, you know, they're better than I am at it. Uh, I think I'd probably be still pretty good at it in a real airplane, but it's just a different set of skills. And right. so giving people an opportunity, whether it's putting them in a business environment and having them solve a problem or having them, you know, uh, change a part on an engine through a virtual, you know, VR kind of technology, actually moving your body and thinking through a process while doing it and then taking the time to unpack it and debrief it like we've talked about today is vitally important. So we need to figure out how to do that. There are there are lots of things that we just can't learn as effectively as we should uh, in a classroom or by just thinking about it. We have to go do it. Yeah, and I think that future is not that far off, especially in light of what I see as an acceleration um, coming uh, because of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. There's a company called Striver, I know, on the, on the west coast of the U.S. that uh, um, was created by a graduate student um, asked uh, by the head football coach, he was also an assistant coach, this grad student, to um, help develop um, skills for football players, American football players. And um, that translated into uh, a good set of experiments that yielded the right kind of results. And now it's used in a, a variety of settings. But I understand that's been picked up by Walmart for customer yeah. service training and for safety training. And yeah. you know, these opportunities, uh, I think, I've always thought that the space between business and higher education academia is a rich one where we're really just trying to create those in, those environments where we can make the mistakes, get the feedback and not, yeah. um, you know, crash a billion dollar <laughs> machine at the same time. Yeah. And, um, there's, so I think those days are coming. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's something, Dan, about, um, cognitive processing and task loading you know anytime you're in a you know what simulators really allow you to do and i do think that the the high-end video games are are good representations of this idea is that when when the level of complexity you know gets to a certain point and you are spending some amount of your processing on just the kind of the basic blocking and tackling i have to kind of get from here to there and then on top of that, I've got this thing that I didn't expect and that thing that I didn't expect and this other thing. You, you, you very quickly get to this cognitive overload situation. And that's what, so you mentioned earlier, I teach a, a course in crisis leadership. That's what crisis leaders are grapple with. You know, all these, these individual decisions that they have to make, if it was just that thing and that decision, it might not be so hard. The reality though is that it's, it's compounded by the other 50 things that they need to be grappling with. And I think right, there's right. finding ways to get learners into situations where they're processing multiple things simultaneously and having to 
to you know, prioritize things and figure out which are the most important and do those. That's what simulation, I think, allows us to do. And those are the kinds of things that I think next level, next generation leaders are going to have to be better at. Right. Great. Mike, you've been wonderful with this. I uh, always appreciate the opportunity to catch up with you one on one, but I've been um, excited about uh, your willingness to do this in front of a, quite a few people and uh, address their questions along the way and cover a lot of territory. We went we, from we did, didn't we? these project based learning to internships to relationships with companies and how we're handling the fall term and ultimately uh, took a step into virtual reality, augmented reality. So thank you very much, Mike. It's been a pleasure to, to catch up with you and I look forward to the next uh, opportunity. Great, Dan, it's uh, been my pleasure. And, uh, and for anyone, we talked a lot about MAP and experiential learning here. Um, the team at Ross is a spectacular team uh, of uh, action-based learning experts. So, you know, find them, find us on a website, go see the kinds of things that we're doing. If you have questions or if we can help you, uh, that's what we're here for. So uh, feel free to reach out. But uh, the team has been fantastic. So again, you, you let me take some credit for it today, Dan, but uh, I just... I just got to stand back and watch my, my rock stars do their thing. I know, I, I think that's great. It's a great team there at Michigan Ross and we appreciate having uh, Michigan uh, participating and working with the Global Business School Network. Indeed, stay tuned for uh, future webinars with the Global Business School Network. Uh, there's a series, uh, if you're interested, visit our website, www.gbsn.org called uh, uh, business, The Business Proofing of Business Schools. And it's in partnership with Zolas and EFMD. So there's a series of webinars we think are particularly uh, helpful for business schools moving forward. So we look forward to seeing everyone there. And thank you again, Mike. We'll see you soon. My pleasure, Dan. See you, right. everyone. Bye -bye. Good luck. Bye-bye.